Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Corey, better known as the Seaman, and I want to welcome you to another edition of the Seaman's Cinema. Sit down, and the Seaman's horror run this week continues as another horror, this time slasher movie, um, that I thought was supposed to come out today. I won the province I've had while being off and just in the apartment working on things. I'm losing track of days even worse than I do when I'm normally just like regularly working all the crazy hours that I work uh, at my regular job. But I, I thought that this movie came out today. And when I looked at AMC yesterday, it, it was it was already out. So naturally I found myself over in Port Chester at 7 o'clock for this sequel film that I personally was kind of excited for. Uh, the first movie, while not great, did lots of things that I enjoyed and the idea of a bigger budget and hopefully a better outing was something I could not wait to check out myself. What is the third movie in the horror realm that we've seen this week? Why don't you pull up a chair, take a seat. We are getting ready to dive in spoiler free into Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. And before we get there, something that I haven't noted about the desk, I have cool lights under this top board that kind of light up all of my Spider-Man figures. So if you see those popping, uh, it's because I like them. I just forgot to turn them on in the last video. But... Now we direct our attention to Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2, and I have to say, I think that this movie is a significant step up from the first movie. And, you know, there were things in the first movie that worked that obviously were going to transfer over to this film. I think writer-director of the first movie, Reese Frake Waterfield, really understands the campy slasher realm of horror movies. Uh, I thought all of the elements, for the most part, in the first movie worked really well in that realm, and the kills, some of them were wild, but they were all really solid, and that was the thing for me. When it comes to Blood and Honey, I was like, look, if you're going to take this public domain stuff and do a slasher flick with Winnie the Pooh and Piglet... I better get some interesting deaths, and you certainly do. And there were things that happened in that movie, CGI-wise, that are not great. But there's at least one kill where I was like, they definitely poured most of their CGI money into this shot because the head exploding underneath of a car tire, um, I thought actually kind of played really well. It was one of those moments where you're like, oh man, what? <laughs> that just happened? Um, so obviously all the slasher elements in the first movie worked. Um, the score was another thing that I thought was excellent in the first movie, having just rewatched it yesterday. And, you know, it's one of those things that definitely transfers over to this movie as well. The scoring has this, like, demonic evil presence quality to it that just gets under your skin. And any time the characters of Pooh or Tigger or Owl or Piglet pop up on the screen in this one, and Pooh and Piglet in the first one, just the tones to what's going on with the score, I was like... I dig these, like, demonic vibes, even though these aren't necessarily demonic beings. Um, so the score was really good, and the set design in the first movie I thought was tremendous. Like, going in and out of the Hundred Acre Woods and all of the the, the, the different tree-type things that they had, like, that stuff all worked really well. And then, you know, the movie ends up mostly taking place at a cabin, which... You know, not a lot of places to go to, but definitely worked for the different kill setups. You know, you got the pool, you got the hot tub, you got the car in the driveway. So, like, all of that stuff in the set design I thought worked really well. So, when you get to Blood and Honey 2, it's no surprise that all of those elements still are working really well. Uh, I continue to really dig the 100 Acre Wood sets, um, whether it's coming in or out or being in some of their lairs. We get a little bit more time in the areas that like Tigger, Pooh, Piglet, and Owl are hanging out and they do just have this kind of, there's almost like to some of the rooms like a, a Texas Chainsaw quality to them, right man? Like dark, dingy, you can tell things have been murdered in these places. Um, and, and the vibe I think of the sets this time around just really, really clicks as does the score. Same kind of like we were saying, those demonic tones and vibes underneath specifically Tigger and Owl. The Tigger, when the score hits underneath those two, I think those are probably my favorite things that are popping in the movie. Um, not to say that Pooh and Piglet don't have good scoring underneath them either, but like Tigger and Owl are the new things in this movie and they really pop and I think the scoring underneath their sequences was just excellent. And then obviously the kills in this movie are just as batty as the first one. You know what? With the bigger budget coming off of the success of the first one's limited run in theaters, I do think that the kills in some manners are improved. There are definitely several 
like shocked that they did that. And then there are, you know, some of your standard ones. But the one thing that the budget definitely does improve in that realm is the body count. Oh, the body count is high in this movie. Like, you had, what, five or six girls that were hanging out at that cabin? Like, there's a rave sequence in this movie. And Tigger shows up to do some wild shit, <laughs> man. So does Boo. Boo and Tigger, they, they thrived in the rave. And, you know, that was the thing. I think having more places to go and allowing them to kind of spread out a little bit definitely enhanced where we were location-wise and what you were able to do with the kills. And then all the slasher elements are there once again. I mean, this movie is campy as anything. And as a slasher lover, I love a good campy slasher flick. Um, you know, the, the just the style and the, the level of gore and the hard R that we get here. All of those elements, once again, coming from Reese Freak Waterfield, work really well. Now, the things that I think were improved upon, besides, you know, just the, the, the set design and the type of kills and, you know, more locations and more actors that were improved from the budget, well, one, this movie is drastically better in the writing department. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Frank Waterfield brought in a second writer to help him out this time. Uh, Matt Leslie, it, being here, produces a better script. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily just because of Leslie or if that Frank Waterfield learned things, you know, as you would assume he would in the first outing. Um, but the script here has so much more depth. I thought the original Blood and Honey was paper thin, right? And the other thing that's crazy with the original is that Christopher Robin gets kidnapped by Pooh and Piglet like right at the beginning of the movie and then you stash him away until this random group of girls who are hanging out at this cabin right by the Hundred Acre Woods stumble upon Chris. And it was something that kind of disconnected things from the movie because, like, if Chris is the antithesis of all the things that were wrong for the characters once he leaves for college, you know, and they almost starve to death, they end up eating Eeyore uh, in a cartoon. The opening of the first one used, like, animated, draw like, creepy drawings. Um, so, like, they end up killing and eating Eeyore, um, which terrified all of them, and then they stopped talking, they became feral creatures, right? All of this stuff is because of Christopher Robin, and he's nowhere to be found. Well, this movie, Christopher Robin is front and center, and the story is directly connected to him the entire time. And there is a lot more depth to the story. There's actual th emotional beats. Like, the, the things that are going on with Chris mentally coming out of the last movie and just his life around these characters, you know, creates a character this time around that has layers to him. And there are emotional beats, and there are things that you're invested in. That was the other thing. Like, you're not really invested in any characters. There are elements about Chris, and specifically the fact that you bring in his best friend Lexi, played by Tallulah Evans, and his little sister Bunny, played by Thea Evans. Like, specifically Thea. There are elements where this little girl, she's so adorable, she pops up, you're invested, and the story and the script this time really connect a lot more things to them, and then also expand the lore on the Hundred Acre Wood characters. Like, the one thing I really love about this script is how it addresses the fact that the characters look different this time, and that we have a new actor playing Christopher Robin. Um, the way they kind of weave that stuff into the story, I was like, oh, that's kind of smart and a lot of fun to play with. And definitely adds to you know certain elements of the movie early on that are super enjoyable before we get dark and twisted. Um, so I definitely think there was better writing across the board. Um, better actors. Uh, the acting in the first one was borderline atrocious at times. Like it felt like somebody who wanted to make a movie didn't have resources to go and and you know find people through a casting search and like just tap their friends and was like let's make a movie. You know what I mean? Like there are moments that are all right, but a lot of the acting is not great in this movie. And I must say that Scott Chambers drastic upgrade from the last Christopher Robin. Um, the last Christopher Robin cries more than once in the movie and it always comes off like really bad disingenuous <laughs> crying and look there's a lot of emotional things going on for Chris in this movie and Scott Chambers I thought captured that a lot more I thought he you know while he's not the best actor in the world and you're not going to get any awards in this movie I thought he added a lot of depth to Chris that wasn't there in the first one and it creates the horror elements and the terror that comes from the story to be a lot more because Chris is there, he's seeing what's happening, he's more involved, um, and I thought Scott Chambers did a great job with all that stuff. Tallulah Evans, while she has a small role, again, someone who has quality to her performance and, you know, is a nice number two for, you know, Scott to kind of play off of occasionally. And then, like I said, this little girl, Thea Evans, 
she might be related to Tallulah Evans. I'm not sure, but she was fantastic, man. Like anytime she gets time in the movie, you're just like, I enjoyed this performance so much. And again, is one of the things that creates an investment and stakes for the movie where it's like, if these characters show up and this little girl is around, that's a different vibe than like these characters showing up and just murdering a bunch of random people. I thought all the guys who came in this time, um, newbies, Louis Santer, who plays Tigger, and Marcus Massey, who visually well, his facial expressions in that owl makeup was amazing, but they were just like really nice additions to the cast this time as far as the, the creatures go. And then when you're talking about the creatures, we have drastically better costume design in this movie. I mean, you can see the budget improvement in the costumes. Like the first movie, it looked like humans in bad rubber masks. And this movie, you know, Pooh's got a little fur. Tigger kind of looks like a tiger. Owl is full on feathered and he's flying. It's like the visual effects around Owl I thought were great. Um, but you can just tell the quality in, in the, the costume department is an upgrade. And that is something that also just makes the movie inherently better because you believe that these are actually like humanoid bear, humanoid tiger, humanoid owl and pig type creatures rather than like that's clearly a dude in a suit. Um, there are still elements where you can kind of tell where the suit is. Look, it's a campy low budget horror movie, but drastic improvement from the first time. And then... Again, I think there's slighter, slightly better CGI and visual effects in this one, specifically in the kills. Like, there is one kill in this movie. It might be one of my favorite kills in any horror movie ever. And we've seen the start of that sequence in the trailers where Pooh throws a freaking bear trap onto a girl's head at this rave and then rips the head off. However, that scene cuts on the rip in the trailer, goes for about another five to ten seconds in the movie, and... I, I did not see what happened coming, and I was really, really stoked about it. And the other thing, too, that I like what, with what Frank Waterfield is doing in this movie is when you're looking at the kills, there's a lot more nods to classic slashers, specifically with Tigger. Like, there was a moment in the movie where I was like, man, the writing around Tigger's line delivery is so bad. And then he said something, and it clicked. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Tigger is Reese Frank Waterfield's freaking Freddy Krueger and there is a sequence in that rave that uh toward the end of that rave sequence where like there's this one slightly larger woman who's like above Tigger in a thing dude I was just I was giddy I was like beaming because I saw what was finally happening I'm like oh my gosh Frank Waterfield is like trying to make Tigger his own Freddy Krueger so there were a lot of nice nods there Pooh has some like Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibes to him and we've obviously seen that flaming uh chainsaw in the trailer which that whole bit is a lot of fun with him and chris and yeah like i just the the, the slasher qualities and the, the the campy things that pop up in the movie were great and then watching these characters interact with chris the other thing they didn't really speak at all in the first movie we get voice acting in this one and while Pooh and piglet still remain kind of minuscule in that Pooh's just kind of like i'm the leader i don't have to talk i'll you know constantly giving him updates and then when you let tigger out and there's like there's an element to Tigger like that keeps him not on screen for a while that just kind of builds so that when he does make it his way to screen you're like oh man but him and Al their voice work is fantastic and just the, the design around it was so good and seeing them interact or talk to anyone specifically with Christopher Robin I thought it was friggin' excellent and then there is one thing toward the end of the movie like the movie throughout kind of gives you a couple of surprises and like <gasps> like moments like I can't believe they did that but when one of those happens there's actually a really nice Winnie the Pooh easter egg and that was something that I didn't feel like we got a ton of in the first one and we don't necessarily have a ton of easter eggs here um but there is like a really nice direct nod where it happened I was like oh that's awesome I also really dug that like Tigger sometimes will disappear and then you just hear his voice moving around and while you're not seeing him bounce on a tail it's clear that he's moving in a bouncy way where he can be here and then here and then here and then here and like those elements I thought were worked in better this time and at the end of the day this is just a better movie than the first outing so let's get the Sea Maniacs up and give this one a score um, like I said you maintain the slasher elements and the wild kills and solid score and real good set design and improve upon those as well with the larger budget. But then you take that money and you fuel it into the areas that really 
lacked in the first movie, right? You get better writing, you know, bringing in Matt Leslie to help out Frank Waterfield. You get better actors who just can deliver depth where it doesn't feel like a random person was pulled off the, the street. It feels like you have an actor in front of a camera. Um, better costume design, better visual effects, like all of those things added to those elements that worked in the first one create, once again, a campy, hard R slasher flick that does all the things that you want those types of movies to do. When I was a kid and I watched those campy slasher movies, a lot of those elements are here. And what's nice is this time around, you see more nods to things that Frank Waterfield clearly was influenced by. There's more elements of the 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 hundred acre wood characters that that weren't necessarily there the first time around and this thing's loaded with crazy kills big twists and twisted surprises like there's two things in the movie that happened where i was like i can't believe we did that but we also do things that you can believe that you could see coming a million miles away because you know the, the, there are elements that are predictable here but there are definitely some nice surprises great kills better acting another solid score great slasher elements set design like all that stuff works where at the end of the day no matter how you cut this this is a better movie than the first one i'm going three out of five see maniacs look the acting still isn't perfect the movie isn't perfect but i think frank waterfield is making steps in improving it, it, from movie one to movie two and i'm here to see that continue and if he wants to make another one of these I will once again be at the movie theater because I don't mind if you want to play with these characters in these ways because what I'm getting as a horror fan is working for me. So I'm going to shut up. I'll flip it over to you. Where do you land on all of this public domain stuff? Do you think it's right to utilize Winnie the Pooh and his friends as slasher killers? And if you do think that that's okay and you've seen the first Blood and Honey, are you going to see the second? If you have seen the second, what did you think? Was it an improvement from the first one? What elements did you like? Did you like that Christopher Robin was more involved, that it wasn't random people, even though there are random people that get killed in this movie? Um, do you like the slasher nods, the, the, the just the things that are going on, the setups, the designs, anything that either worked or didn't or just landed in the middle? Good, bad, indifferent on Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. Put it down below in the comment section. Look forward to talking to you down there. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you're new, you want to come hang out with the C-Man anytime. We're talking movies, TV, trailer, reactions. Um, there's some more good horror movies coming. We got Kong and Godzilla tonight. So you want to be here for any of that coverage. You just dig the vibe of the C-Man. And you want to show a little love and support. Come join C-Maniac Nation. Super easy. Jump over there. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that little bell if you want those alerts. And until next time for the C-Man's Cinema, sit down. I've been the C-Man. I'm signing off. Peace! Hey, what's up, C-Maniac Nation? Winter Ken here, where we grow out our roots and our beard, letting you know that you can see some new C-Man videos right up here and right down here. And if you want all those videos and show that man a little love and support, come join C-Maniac Nation right over there, and the C-Man will catch you on the next one.